Are you ready for some excitement? Well, I hope you're not afraid of heights because we're gonna take you zip lining high amongst the trees here in West Liberty, Ohio at Mark and Farm Zipline Adventures. We're gonna have some fantastic fun for sure. That's coming up. Plus, for music lovers, we bring you the blues and tell you about the history of Griffin Hines Farm Blues Club in Swanton. Then meet Dean Arnold, a graphic artist with an odd affinity for pumpkins. We're gonna find out why. And volunteers are building a B-17 bomber in Urbana. We'll admire their handiwork, the Champagne Lady, coming up. Stay right there. Your adventure starts next here on Scenic Stops. Again, everyone and welcome back to Scenic Stops. We have got a great show lined up for you tonight. We're going to visit some wonderful places and meet some great people along the way. We're all set to be your tour guide so let's get it started right now. Here on Scenic Stops we've had a lot of adventure over the years haven't we? We've been bull riding and pheasant hunting even race car driving. Well how about a little bit more? The crew and I have traveled to West Liberty, Ohio. We're here in Logan County. This is actually not very far from where Mad River Mountain is. That's where they have that great snow skiing, right? Well, we're not snow skiing today because it's the middle of August, but instead we're going to go zip lining. That's right, we're here at Mark and Farms Zip Line Adventures. Now I have to admit, I am a little bit anxious about it, but I'm willing to give it a shot. So now let's go and find out more. So I am here right now with the owner of Mark and Zipline Adventures, Terry Mark. And Terry, thank you so much for having me and the crew out here today. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. It is exciting out here. And I am just interested, how in the world did this sort of thing get started and built in your own backyard? Well, three years ago, uh, my son and daughter, 13 and 15 at the time, went on a trip with my parents. Uh, they visited another Zipline course, and my son and daughter were so excited about it that they convinced our whole family to go back and uh, try the experience for ourselves. And during that experience, we decided that we have a really good spot here at our farm. Mm. Uh, we have 90 acres here. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to uh, put a zipline course in here. And uh, that was three years ago. Uh, it took us six months to build it, and um, the rest is history. We tell people that we plant about 50 acres in crops and the rest is playground. We average somewhere between four to 5,000 visitors a year. Um, Thousands. This is our third year and um, you know the first year it was just kind of getting the word out and now that the excitement has uh, taken hold, um, we just see an increase uh, yearly. We have uh, 12 zip lines and we have five rope challenges that we do and uh, it takes approximately two and a half hours to go through our whole course. Uh, you have people come from all over, I imagine. Well, of course, we're located in Ohio, and so Ohio is a given, but we have yeah. people that come from all over the United States and also from many different countries. That's fantastic. So obviously it appeals to people of all age groups. It does. Uh, we have a junior course for ages two to six, and uh, our main course is for ages seven and up, and our oldest participant is 91 years old, and uh, he was just here two, oh two months ago. And his comment before he left was that he was going to come back every year on his birthday. So what would you say, what are one of the reasons why people do keep coming back for more? Why, why do they love this so much? Probably the, one of the biggest reasons is our guides. Our guides add to the experience. Mm -hmm. um, they're so much fun. They do different antics. They make sure they're, you're safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just an overall good time that the guides uh, offer. Well, what do you think? If I'm going to give it a shot mm -hmm. and, and get up there and do it myself, should we go get harnessed up? Kathleen, I think that is a great idea. Let's go. <laughs> okay, so now for the harnessing. Scott, tell me all about it. Yes, okay, to go zip lining, we have some safety things we need to wear. We have the harness, the braking glove, okay. and the helmet. So you're gonna go feet, toes first, and to the right. Okay. Okay, and we're 
We're just going to pull these up. That. Mm -hmm. Helmet. Of course, we have your name on it so we can know who you are as you're zipping along. <laughs> Very good. And glove. This is for braking. All we're right. Going to put that on. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hook this for when we're walking. And then the two safety clips. These are carabiners. They're going to go right there. Okay, Kathleen, here we are in our training area. And the first thing we want to do is we're going to take our safety clips and we're going to clip in one. We're going to clip in two. Go ahead. Good. Now, let's go ahead and lean back. Trust the equipment a little bit. This is what it's going to feel like when we're riding on the zip line. So this will definitely support our weight. We'll be safe the whole time. Now, bare hand here, and you're going to just squat down a little bit, and you're going to say zipping, mm -hmm. and I'll say zip away. Ready when you are. Zipping. Zip away. OK, a little break. Pull down. Speed up, speed up, speed up. Good. Stand up. Now we're safely off the zip cable, and we're ready to go zip for real. You're a good teacher, Scott. Thank you very much. Let's, Let's go. go zip. Well, that was great fun. And if you want adventure like this, you got to get here to West Liberty and visit Mark and Farms Zipline Adventure for yourself. And if you want more information, they have it on their website at markandfarms.com. Now I'm ready to go again. Zip in! Zip away! Do you know of a unique place that I should visit or maybe an interesting person that I have to meet? Well, I'd love to hear from you. Now, it's simple. You can like Scenic Stops on Facebook and be sure to tweet hashtag Scenic Stops during the show. You can also play Scenic Stops trivia every week on Facebook for a chance to win some great prizes. Go ahead. It's really easy. Just go to Facebook.com slash Scenic Stops and we'll see you there. I know many of you out there are music lovers, and by music, I mean the blues. And in Swanton, there's an historic blues club like no other that's been bringing great music to Northwest Ohio for over 60 years. Blues touches your soul. It's something inside of you. Some people know it and some people don't and they feel it and they learn it here. They experience it here. Sometimes for the first time, sometimes, um, you know, it's just something that comes back to them. Or it takes them to a different place. And the combination of that, good friends and family, um, makes for a great time out here. Well, the original owners of uh, Heinz Farm, uh, Frank and Sarah Heinz, they used to call him Sonny, as a matter of fact. Uh, back in the late 30s and the 40s, they uh, were entrepreneurs, and they had an idea. And one of their things that they wanted to do was be able to have a place where people could come, have fun, and have no types of drama. Heinz Farm was a place where everybody would come to. Um, it was actually kind of considered as a black country club of sorts. Uh, you had many famous acts here. Uh, B.B. King, Johnny Lee Hooker, um, OJ's, and a lot, of other, a lot of other groups and artists have been here. But one of the things that they did that was also uncanny and a little bit different is that they had drag racing, they raced motorcycles, they horse raced, they had mini golf, they had skating, um, they had festivals and hay rides. They did anything and everything out there to be able to bring the community in and to give them a good time. Sonny Hines allowed anybody whatever color that they were to be able to come into his club. Um, the only thing that he asked is that they dropped all their weapons or guns or whatever else back in those days and drop them at the door. They could pick them up when they leave, just come and have a good time. After they started uh, with the house over there and they used to party in the basement, things got a little bit bigger. So 
Uh, in the late 40s, they built a juke joint in the back, uh, which in Northwest Ohio were one of the few places to actually have a juke joint. It's been uh, preserved back there, still good standing. Um, and then in 1956, they decided to build this building behind us. And in 61, they started adding on to it, which they added on a pavilion back there, uh, which was for skating. And they also had a concert stage up there as well, which uh, are all still pretty much intact. One of the things that happened in the late uh, 70s, uh, Sarah Hines passed away and it kind of took the wind out of uh, Sonny Hines' sale. Um, after that he got a little sick, uh, the place ended up closing down, they boarded it up and then in the uh, late 70s my dad picked up the place. He has been coming here since he was a kid and he, all, he loves the blues. When he got the place it was a complete disrepair, it was windows and everything were boarded up and all that and he pretty much over the next couple of years uh, restored everything inside of the place. He ran the club for 32 years. He normally had a show or two every month. He had different blues benefits and things that kind of helped contribute to the community. He passed away January uh, 6th of 2013. After he passed away, we were kind of locked out of the building. Ceilings collapsed, the roof, the roof caved in, all the plumbing, electrical, uh, floors were chewed up. Everything was a complete disrepair. Um, a lot of people said that we probably wouldn't be able to do it again and that this place was done forever and uh, we'd probably more than likely sell the place. One of the things that he always used to impress on us was to uh, keep the blues alive, keep it original, no matter whatever happened to him, um, always keep this place going. And uh, that's kind of what brings you to me. I took it up on myself uh, with some other family members as well. to. Uh, give it all ahead, put everything into it. So we've restored the place. Um, we've put a lot of things back in place where they belong. We've repainted the building. We've redone the inside and the outside because of what he did for the community, what he did for us, and what he wanted. His wishes were to have this to, to continue to run. We started redoing this place. One of the things we wanted to do was kind of keep it quiet. We didn't really want to talk about it that much. It was just one of those things that I just had to do. The reception of the people was phenomenal. I mean, people just from all over, all over, all over the country, and I literally mean the country, you know, started contacting us in regards to Heinz Farm. Yeah, I've been there. Heinz Farm this, Heinz Farm that. Through the first era with the actual Heinzes, through my dad's era um, when he ran the place, and everybody had the same story. They were happy, they loved it. They wanted to go back one day if they could. And just like now, I mean, people love this place. You know, one of the things about this place, and it always has been in regards to the farm, is that everybody here is family, everybody's friends. Whether they've known each other before they walked in the doors, you can almost guarantee they'll know each other before they walk out. And um, that's something special, and that's something you don't have anymore. Um, one of the things in one of my placeholds in, in here is to help expand and get the word out in regards to Heinz Farm. We want more people to experience this place and what it holds. When people leave here, I want them to know that they had a good time and I want them to feel a part of that experience because it's, it's, it's an unspeakable one. Um, you kind of just have to be here and then you, you actually feel it, you see it, you know it. And I, that's what I like when people talk about this place that through all the years no matter what, it's always that same good feeling. And nobody's ever disappointed when they come out here. So that's, you know, we always want people to walk away with that. For more information about this terrific blues club, you can visit their website at griffinheinsfarm.com. On Scenic Stops, we've met many talented carvers over the last several years, an ice carver and a chainsaw carver, and up next we meet yet another. And as we will learn, his crazy creative carvings are a compulsion. We take a short road trip out of Northwest Ohio for his story from member station WOSU in Columbus. 
this guy has his own personality and he doesn't share it with anybody else. I saw some extreme pumpkins that it weren't like anything I'd seen before and I just thought, that looks like an awful lot of fun, I, I should try that. Yeah, I've carved a jack-o'-lantern before, let's see how far I can take it. Well, generally, I'm looking for the shape. Um, tall pumpkins make great open mouth scream faces um, or real more realistic faces, um, whereas wide pumpkins make really great grins and you can really exaggerate the, the expression. Heaviness is a big thing too because the heavier it is, the easier it's going to be to carve. I don't hollow out the pumpkin, I just carve the surface of it. So all I do is shave off the, the rind and then just immediately start. First thing is to decide on an expression. The more extreme and exaggerated, the better. This could be a surprised face on this side. This could be a scowling face on this side. I like to know which way the stem is going to be facing. So I don't, I don't want to carve something that where, the, where the stem disappears and you don't see it later on. The way it starts is, is I, I take a large tool, a scraping tool, just at random expose some of the meat. Once I've gotten the rind off of, of the center area, I don't know what it's exactly it's going to be yet. All right, I have decided this one is going to be scowling with his brow, but he's going to be grinning widely with an evil grin. So I start just kind of digging out the eye orbits and around the nose. It depends on, on how the pumpkin cooperates with me. I have one exacto knife that I use for the for the final tiny little details, like when I'm cutting the teeth or something like that. Um, but almost everything is is just a scraping tool. These things are like sandpaper. It's like they make great smoothing tools. Whenever I get to this point, I have this overwhelming memory trace of when I'm at my dentist and my dental hygienist is flossing me. They all rot. They all rot at about the same pace, but they generally last about two days before the nose starts to shrivel up and, and dry. And, and usually by the time I do throw them out, it, I have to use a shovel. <laughs> Last year it was just an experiment to see if I could do it. This year is less of an experiment. It's the, exper the experiment's still there, but now it's to see how well I can do it. I'm nuts! Are you kidding? <laughs> it's a compulsion. Still to come, we're going to take you back to the 1940s with the story of some amazing volunteers who are building a World War II B-17 bomber by hand in an airport hangar in Urbana. That's next. In our next story, we introduce you to the Champagne Lady. She is beautiful for sure, and she preserves the memory of our World War II fighter pilots thanks to many dedicated volunteers. Our final scenic stop is to Grimes Field Airport in Urbana. Uh, I'm Randy Kemp, and I'm the project manager here at the Champaign Aviation Museum. It uh, initially began with the acquisition of a B-17 as a project airplane. Uh, back in 2006, Jerry Schiffer was the businessman. Uh, the day the airplane was delivered here, Jerry was uh, killed in a plane crash in Montana, so he didn't get to see his B-17. Uh, the family took a pause and over the course of a couple of months decided that they wanted to continue the project and do it in memory of the dad and, and uh, in honor of the mother. So we carry uh, the county's name, Champaign County, 
Uh, our nose art is basically, it's a state of Ohio. Uh, Urbana is a red star, and we have a, a redhead holding a champagne glass, and uh, she's a champagne lady. We're gonna build a flying airplane. Uh, currently, we've got uh, the fuselage here in the hangar and work. Uh, we're about 85 to 90 percent complete with a fuselage, and uh, there's a lot of this airplane that we were missing. Uh, it's amazing because one of the volunteers said, anything you need, you just go put a chair by the front door and wait 20 minutes, it'll walk in. I've been after an upper turret, which is a flight engineer's position, the top gun turret. The phone rings, and it's a guy in Springfield. Do you need one? And your chin hits the floor. You're standing there. He's talking about what you're looking at, that uh, it's pretty spooky sometimes. I don't think there's too many people that all of a sudden you have a Norden bomb site walk in. And they tell you, here, you got to have this. You know, I can't use it. I don't need it. Uh, navigator comes in with a Navigator gyro compass, which is, by today's standards, quite a boat anchor. It's a big, heavy gyro. And uh, he said, my dad had this. He was a navigator on a B-17. He said, I want you to have it. I want it in a B-17. I said, it's going in one. Uh, I've got a lady who came in for a visit from West Virginia. And she left us, uh, promised she was going to mail us a switch. Well, it's a switch for three lights that are underneath the, uh, the belly of the airplane back where the ball turret is. And they were called recognition lights. She sent us that light, and with the letter she said, I have no direct link with a B-17 other than this switch, and I would like to donate it in the memory of General Savage from the 12 o'clock high 1960s uh, TV show. Our, our throttle quadrant, our ball turret, uh, the Astrodome, those came out of a bar in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, there's no telling where this stuff's going to come from next. Uh, I went in the service when I was 17 and uh, ended up in a, a unit called the Strategic Air Command. Uh, so my first, uh, first airplane was a B-52. I'd come up to go fishing here locally and uh, had my dog in the truck and canoe on top of the truck. and and I pulled in and kind of got an initial tour and talked to a bunch of the volunteers. And uh, they could tell that I had a little bit of background as to what I was talking about. And uh, so from then it kind of grew, I started volunteering. The, uh, when you get to uh, the age that some of us retirees are, uh, you decide, what do you want to do with your time? Do you want to sit around and, and watch TV? And my answer is absolutely not. But uh, in a six month period, we'll have uh, up to 95 different volunteers. A guy comes in from Kansas, he'll be in here in a couple of weeks. He'll stay 10 to 14 days. Uh, I've got a guy who flew as a ball turret gunner. Uh, he came in yesterday with uh, quite a crew. They had uh, 15. Guy comes in from England. Uh, he'll be in Fourth of July week for a week, and it's uh, it's pretty neat. So you've you've got quite a few trails that cross here. So it's a big big deal to be able to migrate from the analytical end of why you do certain things in the design and analysis and the building of an airplane to actually get on you know, 30 years later with a hands-on experience of putting one together is has been a uh, very satisfying uh, part of, of the whole project. You have to actually have that, I think, that inherent desire in yourself. You can't walk up to a typical man on the street uh, and, and expect him to show the same interest that you have. If we turn around, we look at a B-17 and go, yeah, yeah, we're building a B-17. Now, when you turn around and you look at somebody else looking at it, that's the reward. Uh, it's pretty neat. So to see a guy come in here who's got uh, a failing health, uh, 
they're in their 90s. Uh, he gets to where he can see enough of the airplane, they'll pause. Uh, he'll tear up, will tear up. Uh, give him a second. He'll catch himself, he'll right himself, he'll stand up a little taller, and the adrenaline starts to move. And uh, when they get near the airplane, even to just touch it, uh, to see it, a uh, shining brand new B-17, it brings those stories out. And it's, uh, it's humbling. Well, that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the show. I know I sure had a great time here at Mark and Farms Zipline Adventures. Now, we've got another great show for you lined up next time. And until then, if you want to watch any of our previous segments, you know they're on our website at scenicstopsohio.com. You can also send me your story ideas there as well. So until next time, everyone, thanks for watching. And remember, the view is always nice from our Scenic Stops. Coming up next is Northwest Ohio Journal with your host, Steve Kendall. What's the topic for us tonight, Steve? 